Glad that you have joined us. Please stand as we look at a few verses from Psalm 96 to begin our time of worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. And Father, I pray that we would do that. Not only here this morning, as we're gathered together as a local body to worship you, but that we would live a life of worship, of praise. To your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.
And my soul was blessed. I had to just shut my mouth and listen, listen to you sing. Oh, it's glorious. And that line where hope springs eternal, my, my mind went to Psalm 36. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures with you. Psalm 36, verse 9. With you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And that fountain is eternal. That eternal source of hope that we have by and through the eternal God. Amen? Amen? Well, that's a little better. <laughs> but you checked out on me in a split second. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Our, our memory verses for this month are found there in verses 19 and 20. Uh, we've been looking at this matter of letting us to draw near, let us hold fast, and uh, to let us not forsake, or to let us consider one another, which we'll be looking at next week. And so... Again, this week, we're going to read verses 19 through 25. If you've been here for the last two or three weeks, you're, you're saying, well, boy, we've been looking at these a lot. That's right, and I hope that you're getting it. The more we look at it, I, I hope that you're getting it. I pray that you're getting it. Verses 19 through 25 of Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is what, church? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you to be able to call you Father. I am so grateful for the time of worship thus far of singing praises to your name and singing praises to Jesus, our high priest and mediator, uh, singing praises to the blessed Spirit of God who does the work of regeneration, who comes to dwell within and seal us onto the day of redemption. Father, I pray that your Spirit will take your word and will make us attentive to it. Uh, I pray, as I often do, that our entire inner person, inner being, our mind being our intellect, our affections, uh, Father, emotions, will be touched and stirred, and, and Father, that our will, that our, our will will be challenged, and if we have not yet yielded ourselves to you, 
that God, you would use this time of your word going forth to move people to drawing close to you and those who know you to cling to you all the more. Father, do this for your glory. Do this for uh, the furtherment of your kingdom. Do this for the edifying of the church. Do this for the glory of Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. <clears throat> so the elderly couple was driving down the road, married for 50 plus years. And as they're driving down the road, uh, an oncoming vehicle comes. And they noticed at first it looked like the driver had two heads. But as they got closer and closer, they realized, no, it was just two people sitting very close together in the car, a young man and a young woman. Silence for a while as they're driving down the road. The wife looks over to her elderly husband and said, we used to do that. Why don't we sit close like that anymore? And most of you know the punchline. The elderly man looked at his loving wife just for a second and said, who moved? Some of you will get that. Who moved? If we're not close to God, who moved? If we once walked in close fellowship with him and now we're sort of distant, who moved? Now granted, there are times when it seems as if God pulls back for a little bit. I think he does that so that we will realize, hey, I need you. And we do pursue all the more. Well, we've been looking at this matter of drawing near to God. This is now the third week. And some of you are wondering, are we ever going to get off of verse 22? And, and yes, I, I believe so. Today we're looking at a message entitled, Sincere Faith and Secure Hope. Sincere faith and secure hope. Because this is what I see in these verses. And so just a little bit of review from, from last week. Uh, I challenged you with an acronym. How many of you remember that? None of you. Well, that's good then. It won't be review. It'll be like the first time. Eric, if you want to put that up there, please. So follower of Christ, DIY, do it yourself. Live with sincere faith and secure hope. Pray that God will help you to be diligent, intentional, yielded. And my prayer has been since last week of, of the DIY, and we did narrow it down to just three words, diligent, intentional, yielded. That that's how we will live. And so whenever one of those shows come up on TV or you're walking through a store and it has a DIY and, and you're all about those things, that your heart as a child of God, a follower of Christ, will be stirred to think, yeah, this is how I need to live my life as a Christian. To be diligent, intentional, and yielded to God. And the responsibility does indeed lie upon us us. I can't live your life. You can't live mine. I'm not responsible for your life. I am as a pastor. And, and in fact, this, this letter that we're looking at, the letter to the Hebrews, I will give a double account. I, I will give an account for how I live my life as a follower of Christ. I will give an account on how I shepherd the flock that has been entrusted to me. But each of us will give an account. Each of us are responsible for how we live. And so in this, in this letter to the Hebrews that was written probably around 65 to 68 A.D., before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., the writer of this letter is encouraging the, the Jews, the Hebrews who had come to saving knowledge of Christ, to keep the faith. That's a little background. He was encouraging them to do so because of the persecution that they were experiencing, mostly from their own countrymen, their own people. 
the Jews that didn't come to Christ, challenging those who did to come back to the faith, come back to the law of Moses. That's the only way salvation can be. And so they were being persecuted over this. And so the writer is showing them throughout the first nine chapters and into the tenth chapter how, how Christ is that final sacrifice for them. And that it's not keeping the law that saves, but it's faith in the one who gave himself, the, prophet, the Messiah who was prophesied of. And so he's encouraging them to live out and work out their salvation, to take what the Spirit of God had, had placed within them in their faith in Christ and to live that out and to hold on to that faith regardless of what might come. So that's a little bit about the then and there. And you and I today, for the most part here in our area, do not deal with much persecution. We may deal with a little bit of ridicule, a little mockery, a little scoffing, but not actual physical persecution like many of our brothers and sisters all over the globe do. In fact, on our uh, backboard there with uh, the missionaries, uh, there's an update from Empower, uh, and you'll see how there is much persecution and people are risking their lives. So because we're not in the then and there as the recipients of this letter was facing persecution, does that make this passage of Scripture then void? No. In fact, a lot of times people can wonder just how applicable, how practical, how rational is God's Word for us today. And so I just want to remind you that in this passage... There is much for you and I to be benefited by if we would put into practice. Because God's Word can be applied, should be applied, in every circumstance of our everyday life. In every situation that we find, we can find solace, we can find direction, we can find help, we can find encouragement through God's Word. So instead of thinking, well, I'm not suffering persecution, but how many of you are suffering from anxiety? Or, or perhaps depression? How, much of you, how many of you may be just struggling to get through a, another day, just wondering if you just have enough strength to get through the day? So to me, in hearing uh, these These commands, these warnings, these encouragements to draw near to God and to hold fast to Him should be a means of encouragement wherever we may find ourselves in our everyday lives. Because dark days can just come creeping upon us, can't they? Doubts and fears can just come out of nowhere. And drawing near to God can help alleviate those fears, those worries, those disappointments in life. And so, yes, I very much believe that these verses that we just read have much application for us today. But I think if they're going to be helpful to us, We have to come to an understanding, and and I ask you, have, have you come to this place in your life of taking God at His word, at face value? In other words, do you understand, do you see the word of God, the Bible, as history? That as we read of creation, of God, of man, we understand This is God's word to us. And this is indeed historical. And the Bible is filled with prophecies and many of those have already been fulfilled. Have you come to that place where you take his word as this is truth. And this alone is worthy 
for me to build my life upon. Because once you come to that place, you now have a foundation in which to build the rest of your life here on this earth upon. You will have meaning, you will have purpose, and you will experience the blessings that God has for us as His children. So let's look at Hebrews 10.22 one more time. I don't plan to look at it next week, but hey, I don't know. And there are some lines on your bulletin for you to just work this verse out. As far as words that stand out to you. I'm going to draw your attention to a few of them, but let's just read that verse or look at it together. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know, in James it says something similar where he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Where he talks about cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So if you've come to that place of taking God for his word, believing it is true, and, and, and yielding yourself to it, then, then this is what we're called to, to do, and that is to draw near. What does draw near mean? We talked about that. It means to approach him, to come into his presence, to not only to come, but to continue there. To continue there. And we're to do that with a true heart. Now, I'm going to say this a couple times so that you get it. How do we draw near? And one can say, isn't this one of the ways that we draw near, meeting together like this? And I'd say, yes, absolutely. But that's only one setting. And for the most part, once a week, correct? We have to draw near more than just corporately and collectively like this. But this is one way of doing it. And we'll talk about that next week, Lord willing, in this matter of, of considering one another and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But for today, drawing near, this is one way we do it. Another way that we do it is by seeking God ourselves. And, and we talked about this, and I'm going to give it to you again, though. Real quickly, we need to learn to have this matter of, of just quiet time with God. And I'm not going to tell you how to do that or how you have to do that. But I strongly encourage you, follower of Christ, you can't draw near without quiet time with God. And you need that, and I need that. To find a time in the day to, to bow in His presence, whatever that looks like for you. And I like to give Him the first fruits of the day instead of the leftover change at the end of the night. But, but whatever works. To fall before Him, to, to humble yourself before Him with the Word of God open before you. And seek His face. Read his word. Say, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from your word. Speak to me, God. Speak to me. Draw near to me as I desire to draw near to you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 to, to go into your closet, your prayer closet, close the door, really representing shutting the world out the best you can and really focusing on God. I can shut all the doors there are to shut, and yet this mind's just going 100 miles an hour in, everybody, or in every direction. Does anybody else have that problem? And, and so for a while, it just takes, it takes some time to just get focused. Do, do, do. Read that verse six times. I'm going to read it a seventh because I can't get it because I can't stop all the voices and everything else is going on. Fight through that. Do it. So that's one of the ways we draw near. To sing praises to him, to give him thanks, to read his word, to seek him in prayer. That's one of the ways. Those are the best ways we draw near to God. 
And then you get up from that and you strive to keep communion with him. Now we have communion with him because his spirit has indwelled us. But we learn to keep that communion not only in the secret but in step. And we've talked about that several times. So as you go about your day, and I like to do that myself actually, is to get up from kneeling into my prayer chair and reading his word and praying, and then just get up and just keep the conversation going. How many understand that? And then just try to keep the conversation going throughout your day. And don't feel bad if, whoops, somewhere along the line, I sort of drifted, but there you are, God. Because remember, he doesn't move, he's there. Right? So that's a little bit about drawing near the heart. The heart. Draw near with a true heart. Do you realize our hearts, in of themselves, meaning our inner person, is not true? That might come to a shock to some of you. That may be sound like an insult to you. But our hearts, because of our fallen nature, are not true. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. A true heart is a heart that has been made true. It's a heart that's been regenerated. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So we're to come with a true heart, and we're to come with full assurance of faith. A true heart, a genuine heart, a sincere heart. We don't have that. We have a heart of stone, God's Word tells us, that is stubborn and self-willed. How's that? How many are relating to that? And how many are thinking of somebody else instead of yourself when it comes to a stubborn heart? You know, we need to think of ourselves, of the person in the mirror. But we are called... We are called to come to God with a true heart, and the only way we can come to God with a true heart is to have our hearts made new. Let me read a couple verses from Ezekiel chapter 36, and we'll have a couple verses on the screen as well. But Ezekiel 36, starting with verse 24, and God is talking to Israel, to the nation of Israel, who were constantly being stiff-necked, hard-hearted, stubborn. And because of it, we're carried away captives. But God's mercy and God's grace and God's love says this, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And you may be thinking, well, that's, the, that's Israel, that's the Jews, that's not us. Every one of us are, are guilty. And Israel was to be a light to the nations. Because remember, God gave the promise to Abraham through you and through your descendants. Will the nations be blessed? And so here's, here's the two verses I want you to see from this, if we can, Eric. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So instead of that stony heart, he replaces it with a viable, responsive heart of flesh. Don't let the word flesh get you uh, messed up there. He, He takes the stony heart away, and he replaces it with a new heart. That is, that is responsive to God. This, this is talking new birth. This is, new, this is regeneration. This is a person being born again, if you will. And he will take the heart of stone out of our flesh. Give us a heart of flesh. And then notice what else he says he will do. I, I will put my spirit within you. My spirit within you. Friends, that's the only way you and I can draw near with a true heart, a sincere heart, a genuine heart, is a heart that has been made new. 
where God takes His Spirit and comes to dwell within. And when that is the case, there will be a desire to walk in His statutes, to walk in His ways. Will we get it right all the time? No, no, no. But our desire will be to get it right. <laughs> and it's not us getting it right that makes us right anyhow. It's the fact that the life of Christ is now within us by and through the Spirit of God dwelling within. We are now made right. And so the question is, have you experienced a change of heart? And only you can answer that. I'm reminded all the time of my old heart. And I'm not talking about my AFib either. I'm just talking about how quickly my mind can go places it shouldn't. I'm reminded almost daily that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I mean, understand what I'm saying. When you're just taken back by, why would you even think that? Because of your fallen nature. And that's the old inner person. That's the old heart, if you will. But the fact that the new heart acknowledges that and is appalled by that and, and cries out for forgiveness, we, that is proof that our hearts have been made new. And in fact, in Romans chapter 8 and also in Galatians chapter 4, God's Word tells us that His Spirit, the Holy Spirit that, that Ezekiel's talking about here and, and prophesying about, that His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So if there isn't another heart within uh, then you need to be concerned. If all you're operating is out of, out of your fallenness, then you can't draw near to God. The first drawing near to God is the initial matter of coming to Him as a sinner and saying, be merciful to me, a sinner. And He cleanses us. And I love that Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, that we've been looking at, talks about that cleansing that takes place. And the verses that I read to you prior talk about that cleansing. Then I will sprinkle clean water on it, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. And that's exactly what Hebrews 10.22 is talking about. Let us draw near with a true heart, a, a new heart, a heart that God has put within. And now our evil conscience, now our inward uh filthiness and uncleanness it is, is cleansed. And it's not baptism that does that. Baptism is symbolic of it. But it's the Spirit of God that cleanses us. And it's the blood of Christ that has atoned for our sins and, and, and makes us clean. As Isaiah said, come, let us reason together. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Now it's God who cleanses us, and He cleanses us from the inside out. And once we're cleansed from the inside out, we are called to draw near with a true heart. And we're to do so with full assurance of faith. And what is faith? Faith is the conviction of a truth. The conviction of the truth of anything, really, it's belief. And in the New Testament, the conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, that you're, that you're uh, convinced of that, that's what faith is. And faith in Christ, that, that conviction and belief that Jesus really is the Messiah, the anointed one, the sent one of God, and it's only through him that we obtain eternal salvation. So this is the faith that he's talking about. A true heart, full assurance of faith, and having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. 
So application is there before you. Have you experienced a change of heart? We cannot draw near, we cannot come close, stay close until we do. You say, well, I did that a long, long time ago. Okay. Are you drawing close? Are you living close? And if not, why? Why? Well, another little, another passage I think would be helpful in this, at least it came to my mind, if, if we can, Eric, take it out of the Psalms. The Psalm that said, with my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. He, he wouldn't say, let me not wander from your commandments if there wasn't a tendency to do so, right? There's a natural tendency for us to drift away, to become distant instead of drawing close. We have to fight against that natural tendency. And the Spirit of God puts within our hearts the desire to draw close. To fight against the natural tendency to distant ourselves and to sort of just drift back. How many understand that? And so it's a matter of fighting the good fight of faith to do so. And this is how we do it. This is how we draw near. This is how we fight the good fight of faith. To seek God wholeheartedly. And then we see, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We see the value of God's word in our everyday lives. That's why it's so important to be in the word of God. To see what God has to say about how we are to commune with Him and how we're to grow in our relationship with Him. And we can't grow if we're, if we're not in the Word. So seeking God through prayer and His Word will help us in drawing close and can prevent us from wandering away. In Hebrews 2, 1 it says this, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Because that's the natural tendency. You know, I was thinking about this, and this term might be a little odd, but then consider the source. Uh, I, think it's, I think some people need to find a new go-to. Because in difficult times and struggles, again, maybe times of anxiety, times of depression, times of being discouraged, times of being disappointed, times of being frustrated, we have our go-tos. For some, it's food. For others, it's drink. For others, it's, it's recreation. But we have these things that we just run to. We call them comfort foods, comfort drink. How many understand what I'm saying? They're go-tos. I'm going to go to this. Child of God, we've got the best go-to there is, and not to make light of God. There is not a better place to run ourselves if we can't in the physical do it in the inner person. So it doesn't matter if you're home bowing before the Lord in your private place, quiet place, closet, or if you're going through a busy uh, store or something and it's chaotic. You still can go there in your inner person and find solace and find rest for your souls. But it's up to you and I to do it. And the Spirit of God is going to be calling us, Hey, get out of there. Get out of that place in your head. Rest here. Is that you? person who needs to find a new go-to well we seek God through prayer through his word this is how we learn to draw close to to come close and to remain there and the draw near is is in the present tense it's a continual of where we're to be really basically living at the next verse 
and for those of you who may be in disbelief, we're, we're leaving verse 22 now, okay? We're leaving. All right, so now let's, let's look at verse 23 together. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. By the way, not to go back to Hebrews 10.22, but this matter of seeking God through prayer and his word and uh, will help us in drawing close. When, when we are seeking God, when we are walking in fellowship with him, regardless where we are at externally, Okay, whether we're in the prayer closet or we're out in, in busy uh, life. When we draw near, when we stay close, the fruit of the Spirit is ours. You understand that? So, in looking at your life and looking at the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, which is love, joy, peace, patience, uh, then I get them mixed up, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, Self-control is the last. Do, does that describe, for the most part, your, your normal day of experiencing the fruit of the Spirit? And if not, then that's a good indication that there's a lack of drawing near and living close. Because when we live close to God, the, the, the Spirit of God is there and uh, empowering us, enabling us, and, and letting us experience the fruit, His fruit. And isn't it much better? I mean, this only makes sense. Isn't it much better to go through life with the fruit of the Spirit instead of without? It's much better. And it's there for us if we live close to God. If we live close to God. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Uh, hold fast means to keep secure, keep firm, a white knuckle grip on it, if you will. To hold on, uh, to cling tenaciously, to cling to Christ. That's what it means. Let's hold fast. But what are we holding fast of? It says the confession of our hope. The King James, I believe, says profession. Well, what does that mean? What is confession, profession in the King James? It's really basically whom or what we profess to be ours. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And so the question is asked, and this is application, is your confession of faith one of profession only, or do you truly know the one in whom you confess? Let me understand that question. Because I'm reminded again, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, not in chapter 6 of Matthew, but this time in chapter 7, where, where Jesus says, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So he's saying there's plenty out there who are professing knowledge of God, right relationship with God, but their confession, their profession of faith is one without true possession of the one they're confessing of. How many understand that? You might have had to have a couple cups of coffee to understand that tongue twister. There are people who confess and profess faith in God who don't even know God. You can't hold fast of something if you don't have it. Right? And so that's a question to ask. Is your confession of faith one of profession only? That's sort of like a, a, a convenient Christianity. Where, where it's convenient, I'll name the name of Christ. When it's not, I won't. Depending on what circle I'm in, what group of people. Let me... Let me Look at it from, from these two verses, because this, this is what came to mind as I was studying this, if we can, Aaron. And so this is out of Romans chapter 10. Some of you who've studied what they call the Romans road to verses to share in, when evangelizing. 
but the Apostle Paul says that, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Do you see the two vital parts here? It's not just the mouth confessing something that isn't true within. Uh, Isaiah, I believe it's chapter 29, spoke about the people drawing near with their mouth, and with their lips, but their heart being far from them. Jesus quoted that in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 18. That, that, that there's plenty of people who will confess Christ. Uh, with their mouths they'll say this is so, but it's not so in their hearts. I was just a young buck when I came upon these verses. And I remember wanting to share them with a dying grandfather and never got the chance he passed before I got to not in the hospital. But looking at your own life, is your confession of faith one that comes from a changed heart, from a true heart? People can confess with their mouth till they're blue in, your, in their face, and you're blue in your face hearing them, and still not be right with God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Salvation is this, a heart that has been made new, a stony heart that has been made viable and responsive to God that now has a desire to confess Christ. That's someone who's been saved. And then in verse 13, and that's not on there, but whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Where are you at with that? For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. By responding to God's gracious call, trusting Christ from, from the inside, uh, we're made right. Confession is made unto salvation. Well, when we look at verse 23 of Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. So we, we're talking about this confession. Does my confession consist of a true possession of God? Do I truly know Him? And if that's the case, I truly do, then I do indeed have this hope. Uh, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, meaning uh, holding on firmly, clinging to it. I will be steadfast, uh, immovable, that's how it will be for our lives. Our hope, what does the word hope mean? And that was Matthew 15, not 18. I just saw my notes. Well, it's a living hope, Peter describes it. Uh, a hope is, is uh, an expectation of good. That's what hope is. We, we say, I hope so, but with that hope, there's often a question of whether it's going to be so. But the assured hope that God gives us is an expectation. We believe it to be so. We have assurance and we have confidence that it will be as God says it will be. And so Peter says it's a living hope. It's an expectation of good. It's confident uh, expectation of the eternal salvation and everything else that God promises us. And we're to do so without wavering, to be firm, to be steady. And then one can ask the question, well, how, how do I do that? What, what makes this what makes this to where I can have that type of confidence and that type of hope? And Eric, if you go back to Hebrews 10, not 22, 23. For he who promised... Is faithful, And I want to close our time together with that truth, that he who promised is faithful. And so that goes back to, do you really take God at his word? Do you believe God is who he says he is? 
Do you believe everything that what God's Word says is so? And, and if you've come to that place, then, then you do have assured confidence and, and hope that, that God is faithful and He will come through with His promises. Right? In Deuteronomy, and the word faithful really means trustworthy, means we can count on Him. There are people that we know that we see them as trustworthy, as faithful, and, and even the best of them aren't a hundred percent. I'm sure not. But God is a hundred percent. He's faithful. And he's true to his promises. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations for those who love Him and keep His commandments. We don't have time to go through all the faithfulness of God that we see throughout the Scriptures. What about this one? Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 23. The psalm that says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son. God promises us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with that temptation will also make a way of escape. God is faithful, God is faithful, God is faithful. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. As far as forgiveness of sins, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who will we see? Revelation 19, coming from the heavens, now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Now he has promised us. He has promised us and he is always true to his promises. Let me close with these two verses. Uh, I guess, yeah, two. I, uh, I had them joined together. In the ISV, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 says, Now this hope, because it talks about the hope that we have. Now this hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Every time we, we experience the Spirit of God bearing witness of our, to our spirit, that should build our confidence. That should encourage and assure us of the hope that we have in Christ. Because this hope doesn't disappoint. And the proof is the Spirit of God living within. In Hebrews 6.18 it says that by two immutable things. Immutable means it's fixed. It cannot change. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. God has set it. God has promised it. Him promising it is the oath. And so then we close with this verse. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, this, this living hope. This hope is this, that God will be faithful to see me through this life until I am forever with Him. Doesn't mean we won't have difficult days. Doesn't mean that at all. We will have. We'll have trials. We'll have struggles. But he promises to walk through us or walk with us through them all until we are forever with him. Does it take faith to believe that? Yes, but he has given us that faith. He's given us that faith. And so this hope we have is an anchor of the soul. I love that. This anchor, where's this anchor set at? 
It's not set on a small boulder that's going to give way when the waters rise. No, this anchor is beyond the, behind the veil. It's in the Holy of Holies. It's in the presence of God. This anchor holds. And it's just like Jesus said. The wise man built his house upon the rock. There's not a better anchor. There's not a better foundation for us to build our lives upon. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul which both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil. What is my life built upon? Upon Jesus, the living hope, which is at the right hand of the Father in glory. Do you have that assurance? Do you have that hope? Let's stand. Our Father, I'm thankful for the opportunity and the blessing to be to live in fellowship with you. To not only to draw close, but to remain close. Uh, thank you, Father, for your spirit that dwells within. And thank you for your spirit that enables us, empowers us to live not only in communion with you, but to live loving you in return and living obedience to you and experiencing your blessings and having that, that living hope for life, that hope uh, that is steadfast, that is sure. Thank you for the anchor that we have. We thank you for our high priest, our mediator, our captain of salvation, Jesus, may those who are trusting him continue to cling to him all the more and those who don't hear his call to come and yield their lives. Help us to be diligent. Help us to be intentional. Help us to live yielded lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
And only a risen Savior can claim that. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And Father, that's evidence to us, that's proof to us that our assurance, our hope is on one who defeated both sin and death. And we have the risen Savior as proof. So Father, help us to draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith. Father, help us to hold firmly to this hope that we have, this living hope, until we are forever with you. We thank you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.